So we're here at Cheetah at 50. Now, I've been, um, more people have been coming in remotely into these classes. And one thing that has been happening is they get much better videos in here because they do a professional job at the sound and everything, which is nice. But the cahoots don't work from in here because the college has a 30 second delay. So my plan is when we get to the coot, I'm going to start a Zoom session anyway. So the remote students can join by Zoom just for the purpose of the cahoot. We'll see if it works. I wasn't willing to do it before because I was having enough trouble with all this new software, but I'm starting to get used to it. So that's my plan, and we'll see if it works better. Because uh, uh, Dale was telling me about the cahoots. With the current system, you can't even see the question until it's over, and the two more questions have passed. So there's no hope at all of doing it. There's answers them. either. Yeah, yeah, so it's really, it's really pretty gruesome. So I'll see if I can make it better. Anyway, we're up to here. Um, by the way, the important thing is a scheduling note. I decided to skip chapters four and five. I was working on getting ready for next time. Four and five are just, um, we've, already, we've already done a standalone deployment, which is a single machine monitoring itself, so you can practice with the tools. This is just a distributed deployment, how to deploy it across a network and stuff, and I'm not planning to cover it, at least not right away. It wasn't interesting enough. I want to move on to these tools, the command line graphical and, uh, and console tools to analyze the data. And um, so this is my new plan, which may be revised again, but we'll skip four and five and cover these other chapters instead. So next week, your quiz is on chapter six. And don't bother right away with four and five. We might come back to it, but I'm thinking probably not. It didn't look very interesting. What's four and five about again? Uh, it's about installing it the other way. We installed it to stand alone. You install it the other way. It's for remote things to be forwarded to it. Which is sort of the enterprise version of installing. It's a good thing, but it wasn't very interesting to talk about. It seemed to be pretty obvious how to do it. Um, I am planning, um, by the way, I've added some projects. Uh, I put in the Splunk project, which is, Splunk is what people really use. If you have money, if you're a corporation, you pay for Splunk. It's a whole lot nicer. All this free stuff is much harder to use. And um, what I'm, I had one here, I had, I'm going to uh, work on it some more, because Splunk, unfortunately, will not install on Server 2008. It only installs on more modern systems like Server 2008 R2. So I'm going to um, make a project using something like Server 2012 R2, where you set up a Windows domain, and then use Splunk to pick up the failed logins on a domain. And I also need to set that up for my CCDC team, uh, because those students need to practice on domain logins and domain credentials and pass the hash attack. So I had it all set to go today on Server 2008, and then I realized at the last minute I can't put Splunk on 2008, so it's no use for this class. It'll be useful for other classes, but not for this one. So anyway. Um, that's my next plan. That'll probably be all extra credit, is setting up a domain and then using Splunk to monitor security events on a domain, which is something we should learn how to do. And I think that's more important than the, the uh, enterprise deployment of, of uh, Security Onion. Because if you're in a big company, you're not going to use Security Onion. That's my feeling. So I'm sure some guy will scream at me that I'm corrupting the world with proprietary software. But the fact is, all the big companies I know use Splunk. It's what everybody does. It's the standard. Because big companies, in America anyway, have no particular attachment to open source. As a matter of fact, it's usually far better to buy something than to use a free product, because then you can demand support and updates, and they'll have a train people to come out and certification classes and all this good stuff, whereas you don't get any of that with open source products. And Splunk is huge. I went to a Splunk convention, and they, anyway, so Splunk, I think, is really important. So, um, that's why I made it one of the required projects to deploy Splunk and get started with it. I'm planning to add more projects where you practice using Splunk. So, here we are. Um, we're down to collecting traffic. Yes. So, once you've um, got Security Onion running, you have to choose some place to deploy it. So, we'll have a very simple network to talk about here, and we'll talk about all the places you might try to sniff your traffic. And problems, like network address translation, um, physical access, and issues about the network security management platform. So here's a sample network, which is very simple, but it displays most of the problems we're going to face. You have an internal network here, which is for company employees only, and has things like your proprietary products and the social security numbers of your employees and things that you want to keep secret. You've got your public servers, like your web server and email server, over here in the DMZ, which is separated from the private network. And everybody on the internet can get there pretty easily by passing through a firewall that lets everybody through. Um, then you have a wireless network, which is less trusted than the wired network, because you really can't be too sure that you know who those people are. Um, 
hopefully in an enterprise you're using something like WPA2, but even so, as you know, people get on wireless networks and you don't really know where they are, so it's not being considered as trusted as an internal network. And they all present different difficulties for monitoring. So uh, here's the game. Um, out here, you've got other networks up to your internet service provider and perhaps other company locations and such. Over here, you've got your public servers and a switch. Down here, you've got your laptops, workstations, and so on. And over here, you've got mobile devices coming in on wireless. All these things are present in a company network, although most company networks are, of course, much more complicated and sprawling, but they have these elements. So if you have people that are on workstations in here and they go to the internet, then their traffic goes up to the main switch, main firewall, and it goes up to the internet. So this is the path that that traffic flows. Unfortunately, here's, uh, here's the wireless traffic coming from the wireless network up to the internet, not coming down here. And here's the, uh, so if you try to monitor the traffic, it is not easy to pick up the traffic you need in only one place. Um, so you can only, now you cannot monitor traffic beyond the external gateway, right? Up here, this is the end of what they call a point of presence um, in a phone network and I think also for networks. This is the end of your network. After that, it's your internet service provider. They might monitor it, but you're not going to have access to that traffic. You couldn't because it includes other customers' traffic and you can't possibly have the legal right to examine it unless you're law enforcement with a warrant. <laughs> or hopefully with a warrant, but anyway. Um, so that's one issue. Um, the other thing, wireless traffic is typically encrypted at layer two. Every single frame is encrypted with a different key for each person. So it's very hard to monitor. All you're going to get is encrypted junk. Uh, and here's another one. Um, suppose you have a local DNS server. So these internal employees have a local DNS server like almost every company has. So when they go to websites, it asks the DNS server, where, what's the domain name? Where's the IP address? It doesn't know. So it has requests up here to public DNS servers. Now, this is a, a risky activity because that traffic is often poisoned. Those caches are often poisoned. This is how a lot of uh, attacks are done. And yet you can't monitor that traffic from in here. That traffic goes from here out. It also, by the way, kind of violates one of your general principles, which is you'd like to know which parts of these network are going to be clients and which parts are going to be servers. And over there, uh, your servers can act as clients in this case. They're making requests going out. So now you've got a problem. It would be nice to say, I'm only going to let external requests come to my web server. I'm not going to let my web server make requests going out because that would be crazy. But in this case, your DNS server does receive requests and reply like a server, and then it makes requests like a client, so it's both a client and a server, and you can't filter traffic based on direction. So here's a web browser. Um, somebody else is trying to go to our website, so they now have to send requests that come into the web server and then have responses that go out. So that's the server acting as a server. The previous one was the DNS server acting as a client. All right, so on the wireless and internal networks, those things should all be clients and not servers. You don't want anybody installing anything on there acting like a server, so you can block all incoming SINs. They should only have outgoing SINs, and then SIN ACK and ACK. Um, the DMZ devices can be clients or servers, so you can't filter that traffic based on direction. And there's a lot of other flows. The internal network, you might have people looking at your own website. This turns out to be actually a problem at this college. If you set a public DNS server, you're not able to reach the grade system inside the college. You have to use our local. We have a separate set of entries only available locally to reach the local path to the resources. And that kind of thing tends to happen. Um, so your wireless people might want to get to the company web server. People in the DMZ server might want to get into your internal network. Now that, I think, is something you would probably like to prevent. That's not healthy. But um, some people might write software that does that, and then you'd have to have something like a company policy telling you aren't allowed to do that. <laughs> Instead, find some other solution than having the web server query stuff for my internal server and then put it on a database. I can see how some clown might do that. Say, I've got to get to the latest prices. I'll just connect it here. But, but I, if I was running the show, I would not let them do that. Anyway, um, so you can put monitors anywhere. All these locations, you could put them here, put them there, put them there, put them there, and everywhere you put them, you're going to get different traffic and you're going to miss different traffic. So you have to put some thought into it. And here's another really unpleasant fact. Almost nobody uses public IP addresses. Now, the original plan of the Internet was you would have one to one. And that's what the Internet Engineering Task Force, who are the theoreticians that plan all this, say we should do with IP version 6, although nobody cares. 
But the idea is you should have one address on, like your phone, and as you carry your phone to different networks, it should keep the same address all the time. So we know where it is. And that can be done in IP version 6, but people don't bother very much. In IP version 4, since there aren't enough addresses, almost everybody uses these private addresses. 10s, 172s, and 192, 168. So that means if you capture traffic, you don't have the right address. If you capture it here, you'll have the internal traffic of 10. But if you capture it out here, it'll have all your traffic will appear to come from the same location, the gateway. That's why, for example, blocking bad addresses is miserable. We have 10,000 computers on campus, but from the external world, they all appear to be coming from one IP address, which is our point of presence. And that's true of almost every company. So if you block someone for attacking you, you might be blocking everybody at that whole college because one guy's attacking you, and that's probably not really what you want to do. So um, here's IP addresses for your internal devices. This is the wireless network at that location. The wired network down here, the DMZ like there. Up here is my real public IP address. Here's a one, one local branch and another local branch. And your, your addresses all go through layers of translation, so you'll get a different address for the same device depending on where you sense for it. So even if you put sensors all over the place, trying to correlate them to figure out what traffic came from what is a problem. And this is why, from the beginning, the IETF and other people have said, you shouldn't be doing network address translation. This is a terrible idea. This is making a mess of everything. This means the logs don't match. You should just give everything an address. What we're doing at this college, by the way, which I've often thought is kind of silly, is we're actually doing what you're supposed to do. We put public addresses on the end devices. Then they pass through a, a translation that puts one public address out there and one public address in here. It, that's the old-fashioned system, where you would have to get um, even if you choose to pass all your traffic through one choke point so you can monitor it, you put public addresses on the endpoints. And we do that in some of the labs here, although not everywhere. The wireless network, for example, um, also has 147, 144 addresses. So we can tell inside who is who, a little bit more than most places. But anyway, here's the private address ranges. These have been set in the request for comment 1918, decades ago. These cannot be used on the public internet. If you try to send traffic to any of these and send it to your ISP, it will just be thrown away because nobody can use those addresses on the internet. They cannot advertise them in border gateway protocol. There is no way to tell anybody that you have a server running on these addresses and they should come to it on the public network, only on a private network. They have to be translated to public addresses, which is done at your firewall or your gateway to the internet. So here's the network address translation. Your local web server may have a private address listing, uh, but you're going to have um, the web server specified here. It's going to have a public address listening on a port, and when it gets requests to the server, which is at this public address, your internal devices will forward it to this private address. And see, that's where the server is, and that's port forwarding. This is what people have to do at home if you run games at home, and your machine is now acting as a server. You have to configure port forwarding on your router, or you, uh, extra other people can't connect you. So this is the one-to-one -one mapping like I was talking about. You have a public IP offering a service, and it's actually forwarded to a machine in the DMZ with one address. So for example, if I have a web server listening on port 80, then I can only have one web server at the whole company. It comes to my one public address on port 80, and I have to tell it which machine is the web server. And if somebody else installs a web server and starts listening on port 80, tough. Nobody out there can see it because the traffic goes to the one designated machine, and that machine, even if it is a web server, can only be seen locally by people inside the company, which is probably what you want. You don't want people running unauthorized servers, but it is an issue, and that's the one-to-one -one mapping. One public port number goes to one private port number. Um, all right, this means you're going to need a different public IP for each server if you want to have servers listening on the same port. Um, so what is almost always used instead is port address translation. This is what everybody has happening at home. Not only do you change the address, you also change the port number of the packets. So now you can have many machines sharing one public IP, and they're each assigned random port numbers. So it looks to the internet, if I have 10 people surfing the web, it looks from the outside like one machine with 10 browser windows open, listing on different ports. Um, and it works although it means your entire enterprise is limited to 64,000 ports, but that's enough for most purposes, unless some clown starts using BitTorrent. This is one of the many reasons why everybody blocks BitTorrent, because one person downloading by BitTorrent is typically using one or 200 connections. <coughs> so a few people doing that, and you actually run out of port numbers, in addition to running out of bandwidth. Anyway, so here's the game. Um, your wireless network is over here with 172.16 ones. And 
Um, it may have a couple devices going places, like uh, two different laptops go there, and it will just assign different high-numbered ports here on the gateway. So they'll, um, they'll both be, it'll be, it'll come out here, get translated here and get translated again, and you'll end up with a random port number that has nothing to do with the actual originating port down here. That's all. Um, all right, got a few cahoots about that. And as I said, I'm going to start a Zoom session to try to give the remote viewers a chance. We will see if that works. Looks like that's it. Okay, so five questions. All right, what technology makes it difficult to identify a source IP address? All right, I guess that thing is not too much in the way. All right, network address translation, of course. Okay. What traffic is encrypted at layer two? Layer two of the OSI model. All right, that's Wi-Fi, of course. Good, popular answer. All right, what devices are difficult to deploy on networks with PAT? Okay, and those are servers? The servers are listening, but because you have a port address translation, it is difficult to direct the traffic to them. You have to configure port forwarding on your routers or on your network address translation device, which may be a firewall or a router. All right, what segment should have traffic flow originating from the internet? All right, in the DMZ, that's its natural state. You're running something like a web server. You expect requests from the outside. All right, which of these is a public IP address? All right, and that's the last one. 192.0 is public. 192.168 is private, but 192.0 is a public address. All right, so the winners. I'll get three winners here, Doug D, Password, and Groot. All right, so how are you gonna choose the best place to obtain network visibility? There are some options. Um, you might try just looking at your internet traffic and figuring that we don't really care about anything local. The only thing we're worried about is external attackers coming in. That's certainly one option. That's C, D, and E. They're all on the public side of the firewall after NAT, so all the addresses should be public. So that's kind of nice, um, but you're not gonna be able to determine which local devices are sending or receiving data. If you have, say, an infected device in there, you're gonna get a uh, address after NAT. So unless you have extensive NAT logs, which you typically don't, you're not gonna be able to figure out which device did it. Yeah? You might flip going back. Yeah. yeah. This is if you look only on the WAN side. And so these guys have been through NAT, so if you see something bad happening, you're going to have trouble deciding which local device was its origin. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, by the way, in the DMZ zone, you can probably tell, because remember, you probably do have a one-to-one -one mapping between addresses on your servers, public and private addresses. Um, but the rest of these, you probably got dynamically assigned addresses. So if you find, say, an infected machine, it might be a different machine having that address later, and you don't really know which one it is. Well, there's wireless traffic. You can go to, at the firewall interface, but the problem is um, all traffic has now been network address translated to one address. So again, you don't know who you're talking about. Um, you can go between, let's look at D and E. 
and you'll see that you're pretty messed up in all these. Um, yes, yeah, CD and E, if you think about the wireless traffic, it has all been translated by this point to the public address. So as an example, it's all going to have the same address, 192.168.13. And if you, unless you go to the outside of the whole company, in which case all traffic from the whole company will have that public address, 198.51. And in both cases, you've got a serious problem deciding which local device was the origin of that traffic. So there's no single place that will let you see what you need. Um, one solution would be to configure your firewall to send a copy of all traffic before and after translation to store it somewhere. Um, but that would then connect the different segments together in one place. And that's risky. It could be of something that it breaks your security boundaries. You might have something leaking from one area to the next. Yeah. So I, I think scenarios that, that their company that netted the actual device, yeah. which I think is an overkill at some point. I'm talking about like each device, they add a server. Um, which is what they're doing here, adding a server. Giving the server a private address, which is kind of goofy, I agree. Yeah, well, it is especially with redundancy, you can have it to like double natting. Yes, oh, uh, double natting, you mean two yeah. layers of nat. Two layers. I've, uh, I've heard of this, but I, yes, it, that's, I've seen people do it. There was a guy, some Australian guys that made 30 layers of nat one time just to prove it would work. But so, um, but I don't know anybody that thinks you actually benefit by having two layers of nat. That's kind of crazy. The only case I know that did that in large quantity was cell phone providers because they ran out of addresses. Sprint, for example. Sprint used the entire RFC 1918 private address space 30 times over. It's not that big. The 10.00 gives you 16 million addresses. The others are much smaller. And Sprint has a lot of phones. So their IP version 4 addresses, there are 30 phones with the same private address passed through two layers of network address translation. So I'm not sure I'd want to be the guy routing traffic from one to the other. That's why a lot of phone companies went to IP version 6 earlier. Because then there's actually enough addresses, you won't run out of them, you can give everyone a unique address. Yeah? If you have that crazy router phone from Cox or Xfinity where they make you take it, and then you plug your personal router into it? That's right. And they literally won't let you not use this thing unless you buy another one. Yeah, this, I just, I'm glad you pointed this out. This is true. Your internet service provider might force you to use their router, which is part of the cable modem, and then you might choose to add another router after to split things up, and now you're behind two layers of that. And that, for most, in most cases, it'll probably be all right. If you're just a client, who cares? But if you're a server, this is really a pain. Yes. Anyway, yeah. Uh, load balancers typically would have just using a real IP. Yes, that's another big issue. Load balancing. If if you're going to have uh, network address translation going to your server, you're going to have to deal with your load balancer. Yeah, you're right. It's another big issue. Yeah. So I mean, putting servers behind address translation is kind of difficult, and I wonder if it's really worth it. Uh, the one other other thing the Internet Engineering Task Force has been going on about for decades is that network address translation should not be considered a security measure. Something a lot of people say is it hides your internal network, and there are better ways to do it. Uh, the firewall that filters certain kinds of traffic is what would really protect you. If your firewall could prevent people from running unauthorized servers by not letting SINs come in from the outside, and that would be that would prevent the running of unauthorized servers without doing an address translation which makes routing traffic difficult. Anyway, um, so here's a better solution. You just deploy three sensors. On the inside, before network address translation, you harvest all the traffic coming from all three segments and have three channels coming in. Now you will have the real address of every device and you'll still see all the traffic that's generated from any part of it. Um, you just have to figure out how to handle it once you've got it into an analysis tool. But still, this is a pretty good option. Yeah? Oh, sorry, man, a question. All right. Anyway, so um, then you can talk about how the, the, you do get physical access to the traffic. One thing people talk a lot is Cisco span ports, uh, switch port analyzer. You, if you have a, a managed enterprise class switch, you can turn on this feature where you have maybe 24 ports of, of data flying in and out, and you configure one of the ports to make a copy of every packet. Now, when I first heard about this, I had like a logic flaw. Wait a minute. If it's running at, say, 10 megabits per second, or I mean 10 gigabits per second on every port, how can the one span port have enough bandwidth to move it all? And this is where I learned something from my friends at Cloudflare. Uh, switches lie. When your switch tells you you've got 24 ports at 10 gigabits, 
What they mean is the protocol is the 10 gigabit Ethernet protocol, and you can connect it to a 10 gigabit device, and the data will flow. You cannot have all 24 of those screaming 10 gigabits of traffic through. It can't handle that at all. It can't even handle one-tenth of that. This is something that, and, and I, because most people don't really need that. They have a burst that big, but they don't have continuous traffic that big. Now, people who really have that traffic is Cloudflare. And they found out, because they, they're a uh, content provider for 10% uh, of the whole internet. So they're not kidding. I'm going to have 24 lines, and they're all going to be screaming all day long at 10 gigabits. And if you try that, it totally can't keep up with it. So they're actually talking about maybe having to build their own hardware, because no commercial switches can really perform that. Anyway, um, it's an issue, and this is another thing also called port mirroring. So you can do this, but the fact is, of course, if your network gets busy, it's not going to keep up with it. It's going to start dropping packets. So, uh, uh, all right. So there's a, uh, a diagram here of, of the setup, just in more detail of what we had. So here's what's recommended by your textbook authors. In the old days, people used to use hubs. Now they recommend buying a special network tap. You just buy a device that will tap into the network, run the traffic through it, and it will make an extra copy of it. Just a special hardware device, and that can really run at line speed. So you add this on there. It's basically a hardware span port. makes a copy of all the traffic and sends it to a third device. Um, all right. And that's better than a span port, because span ports are configured in software, so it could be misconfigured or broken or messed with. Um, or oversubscribed is the obvious thing. That's the uh, polite term for having so much traffic that you can't get it all to go through the span port. So you don't really get all the packets. All right, uh, you can also capture traffic on a firewall or router. You'll see people do this. If you install OpenWRT or DDWRT on your router, it'll give you the ability to install something like Snort on your router. So it runs on the processor of your router, in the RAM of your router. This is for amateurs or people just testing things, obviously, because your router doesn't have any local storage. It doesn't have very strong processors or anything. You know, you might do this just sort of as a stunt, like I see people make an IDS and a Raspberry Pi and stuff. But I don't think you're really going to get it to line speed that way. Um, and uh, so it, it's a thing. Mixing two functions, like routing and IDSing in the same box, is something you wouldn't want to do unless you put a lot of thought into how to make it keep up. Like, for example, Cisco and Juniper do. They have boxes like that, and they have put a lot of thought into designing it so it can really keep up with the traffic. Um, you can also try capturing traffic directly on a server. Now, this might be what you have to do for your response team, especially if your servers are in the cloud. As you know, most people are getting rid of physical hard data centers and putting everything in Azure or Google Cloud or Amazon Cloud, and then you can't touch the hardware. You can't deploy a, a hardware tap. You can't even deploy a span port. So pretty much all you can do is turn on some kind of monitoring on your servers. And so that's something you might do. You know, incident response teams uh, can use this stuff. And I'm going to have a class coming around in about a year of incident response here. I did it once the last time I taught a uh, forensic class. Um, incident response is not about collecting 100% of the data. It's about choosing what data will get me what I need to know and collecting just that. And that's the kind of thing where this might be effective. Um, all right, and you can capture traffic on a client. You can have a laptop running Wireshark or TCP dump or something and catching traffic. Again, it, it might work for a temporary solution to monitor some kind of problem, but in the long run, you're going to have a problem because you haven't really got enough storage on that uh, laptop, and you're going to need a whole bunch of laptops all over the place. So again, you know, this is for a temporary issue, but not for routine monitoring for the long haul. All right, so then you need a network security monitoring platform. Um, this is the server. So you have these network taps on your network. You have cables running to some server or traffic being forwarded somehow over your network to a central server. And this is now running tools. Tools to collect the traffic and store it in some kind of format so it can be searched. And then tools to search through it and analyze it. You, know, you can buy commercial hardware. You can take commercial software and put it on your own hardware. Or you can use open source software to put on there. Any of these will do. Even a virtual machine will do as long as you have enough CPU and memory and to keep up. So uh, things you typically want to have are large RAIDs. You're going to have to store a lot of data on here. Um, you're going to need a lot of RAM. Here's his recommendation, 4 gigs plus 1 gig per line. Uh, have a lot of CPUs and have a lot of network interfaces. So you'd have all that data coming in. So you know it's not going to be, if you're really planning on capturing a lot of traffic, you need a pretty powerful machine to store all that traffic. I know the college does this now. 
And Tim Ryan just visited and talked about it. One thing we forgot to ask him, I think, is the characteristics of our server that are doing this. But um, we do have this. We've had several years we've had network monitoring at the college, at least to some extent. But I don't know a lot about the details of how we're doing it. Anyway, uh, so here's a fun fact for how much data you're going to have to store. The real question is, what is your average network utilization? Like, we have one gigabit networks here, but we certainly are not moving one gigabit per second of traffic 24 hours a day, not in the least. Our peak is only something like 500 megabits, and most of the time it's much less than that, so it's your average traffic. So here's one. Um, you take, you know, just take your network utilization in megabits, multiply it, um, divide it by 8 to get bytes, multiply it by 60, 60, and 24, you'll get the number of bytes in a day. So here's some typical numbers. If your average traffic is 100 megabits per second, and I'm thinking that might be about right for the entire City College campus from the graphs I've seen, then that turns out to 45 gigabits, gigabytes per hour, 32 terabytes per month. And you probably don't want to store anything less than one month of data. I mean, if you get hacked, you'll eventually something will alert you, and then you'll want to look in the past. And if you only have like one day of traffic, that's not much past. So that, that's a bit of storage. That's what I'm saying. You can't just put this in a laptop. You're going to have to have a RAID array or something that can store many terabytes of data. Um, and, you know, some estimates for more data, that's just for the raw PCAPs. And you probably have other things, like a flow diagrams and such. You're going to store flow lists. So something like 40 terabytes for a month of data is a reasonable amount for typical medium to small business, I'd say here. So you know, this is not cheap. So here's some recommendations, um, things to do. Your, the system that runs the network security monitoring should not just be available to everybody. Um, analysts should not be logging directly into there. They should be accessing it through tools to retrieve commands. Um, from the sensor, from the, the security analysis machine, not from the ones acquiring data, I think is the point there. Um, this is an important thing. Uh, beginners usually deploy Linux boxes and everybody just logs in as root all the time. This is, of course, not acceptable in enterprise class application. You cannot have PCI compliance if you do that. And you can't have much in the way of any accountability at your company because you don't really know who logged in and did something. And sooner or later, somebody's going to do something that you have to do something about it. At the very least, you need to, to find out who they are and tell them don't do that again. And you're going to wish they weren't all just logging in as root. So everybody should have their own um, account, and they shouldn't just be allowed to guess, use simple, obvious passwords and write them down and stuff. You should do something like use two-factor authentication. Um, you should, of course, be using secure channels like SSH, not Telnet, to control these devices. Many, many people control their network devices with Telnet and SNMP version 2 and other plain text techniques. Uh, these are commonly used because until uh, the Snowden dumps a few years ago, many people believed that they didn't need to encrypt local traffic. We can just trust everybody within the company. The only thing we're worried about are the strangers outside, and I think that's been blown away by the revelation that the NSA really did have taps inside Yahoo stealing the local traffic. And people finally realized you've got to encrypt the local traffic too because you can't trust all the devices within the physical walls of your building. You never really could, but people continue to trust it long after there was a lot of evidence that that was an unwise assumption. Um, so here's a pretty obvious one. Don't um, take a machine that is doing normal IT functions like web serving and also use it to control the sensors. Uh, this is why you know one of the traditional hacker kill chains is take over the box, now wipe the logs. You want to make that impossible. You want the device that is logging the traffic to be not connected to the device they're hacking into. One common practice is to configure your network monitor with an Ethernet address but no IP address. So even if, so it cannot be seen by a scan, it can only be seen on a local area network, it can receive traffic. Even if someone was to put malware on it somehow, it couldn't phone home and be remote controlled because there's no way to address traffic to it from the outside. It doesn't have an IP address. You don't need an IP address to receive traffic. You just need to get the data there on local area networks. Uh, so that's one trick. Um, anyway, uh, you should have remote access cards in your production sensors so they can be uh, examined from one central location. Yeah? should you know some kind of monitoring tool to have been able to have caught uh, Snowden when he was crawling through their databases and just dumping it onto it? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Could they have caught Snowden? I know there have been a bunch of people in government very, very worried about exactly that. And as far as I know, they're very, there's nothing that would have caught him. The thing about Snowden is, uh, now Snowden denies this, but the NSA swears this is true. He spent a year or two preparing for his attack, and he actually got other people's credentials. 
harvesting them by social engineering and other techniques. So when he stole stuff, he was logging in with other people's credentials. And that's pretty hard to catch, legitimate credentials from another user. Um, the only way you're going to catch that is by somehow geolocating him and figuring out that the real user was somewhere else at that time or something like that. You know, it's, um, that's, that's tough. That's why people, that's why I've been told for years the morale at the NSA has been very low. They've forced all their network administrators to take polygraphs every three months now because they've asked the question, what if another one of our insiders turns traitor? And the answer is, we're screwed. How can you possibly resist that? How can you detect that? I think I mentioned before, there's now a company that will sell you a product to install in your domain that will watch the network traffic and tell you when one of your employees has become disloyal. This is, they used to have these witch sniffers that would go around and which one of these people is the witch with like magic, and that's essentially what it is. I mean, supposedly they can tell that you're not spending more time at, at games or shopping than you used to, or somehow by monitoring network traffic, we can tell which one of you is no longer loyal. I said, boy, I don't know. But there's a huge market for this, because there are malicious insiders, they do more damage than external attackers, and how can you find them? <laughs> it's tough. Anyway, so uh, the sensor, should be responsible for defending itself, um, so don't assume that your sensor is protected by your firewall or anything. Obviously, the whole point of the sensor is to pick up traffic patterns that you weren't able to block, so you should be um, hardening it. Don't expose unnecessary services, update things. Export logs from the sensor to another platform so you can administer it and see if it's working remotely and put its management interface on a private network that does not mix with normal traffic like web server traffic and such. Obviously, you don't want that happening because not only would that expose it to attacks, it would also expose it to denial of service attacks and so on. Um, it's a good idea to encrypt the data on the sensor because your sensor has full packet captures of everything that happened on your network, including on the internal network. And that might contain confidential information. And uh, so you've got a plan to keep your software up to date. You know, you should be, this is the tough thing. Everyone's mad at, at uh, Equifax now because they were two months behind on their patches, but that's, especially these patches were not just patches. They said in order to actually fix this struts problem, they would have had to update to the next version of struts and they would have to rewrite all their code because it was the kind of upgrade that breaks the features. So it is really not fair to say, you rotten bums, how could you let two months go by and not update every, any, that's totally incompetent. So well, it's not really that incompetent. <laughs> it really is a big job to make that update. That's what people are saying. Anyway. So that's it for chapter two. Um, let me just take a quick look and see how much there is to chapter three. As I remember, I don't have much. I want to see, ah, it's too much. I think we'll take a break before we, I'll go ahead, it's 10 minutes to seven. We'll take a break till seven. And then we'll do chapter three, of which I only have a little bit to cover. All right, so I guess we might as well carry on here. Um, so chapter three is mostly just project one, where you deploy Security Onion in the standalone mode, which you've already done. So I'm just going to talk about a little bit of this chapter that's not about the deployment, because the deployment you've done hands-on. Um, so one issue here is you can have a standalone deployment, or you can have a separate server and sensors. So standalone mode is what we did here, just for ease of learning how to use the tools, where you have one network interface on your Security Onion box that's for both management and capture. And that is just so you can really analyze saved captures is the main thing you're going to do with that. Um, server plus sensors is what you do in a real network where you're catching, like in that network before, three sensors out there that really ought to be hardware taps and a separate the box is the server. So the sensors collect data and they send it to the analysis box, which is running something like Security Onion. What's that? What's the SO? Security Onion. Yeah. SO is Security Onion. Yeah. Okay, where do the... What does that look, uh, the sensor look like in the hardware world? Uh, server plus sensors would typically be those taps out there. Sure yeah, those taps hardware. Uh, are hardware collecting the data and then cables carry it back to a special server which is running your security onion or whatever, or Splunk or whatever you're running. Like a mirrored... Uh... Well, not a, well, you could use a mirrored port, but it would be better to just use a hardware tap. Which is basically just a hardware version of the same thing so it can keep up with all the traffic. But either one of them, and then it forwards the data either through a direct connection in your data room or through some kind of virtual connection through an SSH tunnel or something back to your uh, analysis box. So are, are you fine with a software approach that has like agents with minimal footprints throughout your... your, your yes. Plan yes. And send back to Splunk? That's yeah, and the question is, um, is, good, is it good to use agents? And it is absolutely standard. 
that you run an agent on each device which captures the data and sends it back. That's what Splunk does. You run a Splunk server and you have a Splunk agent on each machine sending it back. Uh, these taps are nothing more than basically hardware agents. Um, but yeah, you're right. The, the taps are only going to get network traffic. If you want to get things like server log and IDS signatures, you have to run some kind of agent. And sure, I think those are commonly used. Um, that's the general solution people like. So here's standalone. Um, your network security platform is receiving the data and monitoring it right here. And you just connect to it by some client software uh, like you've done here. You connect, say, from your host through a web interface to some tool like Explico. And you can see information about the data. So this is what we're doing in our projects here, just to get see how Security Onion works. Um, and it's good for only for small networks with small amount of traffic and so on. Uh, here's standalone. SO platform could be here. You can have a single uh, platform down here that gets the traffic from all these and analyzes it. It gathers the traffic and it analyzes it all in one box. That's one way to do it. That's standalone. A server plus sensors is like this. You've got a bunch of sensors out there, and they are forwarding data to one server, which is analyzing it up here. Um, so some processing happens here, and more processing happens up there. Uh, this is what you have to do if you have a large network that's just first around the globe, of course. You can't possibly have one box getting it all. You have to have sensors in each location forwarding to some central place for analysis. So here's servers plus sensors again. Um, you've got sensors up here running some kind of box which runs some kind of software to, to process the data and then you analyze it down here. So it collects data from them and lets you analyze it separately. All right, I say global deployment requires server plus sensors because you can't possibly get all the traffic in one location and you shouldn't. You should just be getting the results all to one location to analyze it. So they'll connect back through some kind of network like a VPN, an SSH channel, something like that to get it all back to the main box that will analyze it. So then you have to put the code on your, soft, on, your, on your hardware somehow. And so there's various ways to do it. You can do what we did here, uh, which is start from an ISO file, a virtual CD, and then install it directly like an operating system. That's one way. The other thing you can do is start with Ubuntu and then um, connect to their personal package archive, which is their software repository, and then do apt install to install it over the network. So you can take Ubuntu and turn it into Security Onion by installing all the tools. And that's fine. It'll work as long as you have a 64-bit Ubuntu derivative. All right. So to install a standalone system, standalone system, that's what you did in Project 1. One network interface, you install Security Onion. Early on in the process, it asks you, is this standalone or server plus sensors? And if it's standalone, you do it with one NIC, and now you're going to monitor the traffic that comes in that NIC. So, that's the end of that. Like I said, there's not very much to it. And I got another Kahoot. I will run the Zoom again for the benefit of the remote attendees. Looks like we got everyone that's coming. Okay. Four questions. All right. So which monitoring system requires you to purchase special hardware? All right, that's a tap. The tap is special hardware just for this purpose. All right, how much traffic does a 100 megabit per second network send in a day? It's one terabyte per day, so 40 terabytes per month is what you need. All right. Which practice is not recommended to manage your platform? Obviously, Telnet is a terrible idea. All right, which one of these is the wrong practice?
Okay. Uh, you shouldn't make your sensor accounts on your normal domain controller because then they get hacked into. They should be separately handled. All right. You shouldn't be mixing. The network is going to get hacked with the network that's monitoring your system. So it's Bro, Groot, and Hoot. Good names. So Groot won twice. All right. So anyway, that's it. I'm going to go to the lab in Science 214 and help anybody who wants to work here, but most people probably want to work at home. This class doesn't meet again until October 10. Uh, so just tell me if you won this thing, and I'll clean up and go up to the lab. I have a question about yeah. security onion. If you yeah. install it on a gun to on top of it, is it security on interface, or is it a gun to work? Is it what? Is security onion, is that what happens, or is it more Ubuntu? Well, uh, so I think security onion is in fact based on Ubuntu. So if you install all the tools from their repository, it'll have all the tools, but it probably won't look the same. Okay. But I think it has the same resulting effect. Okay. Just like Kali and most Linux distribution, most specialized Linux distribution, it's really just a standard Linux with a certain bunch of tools. Right. And you can install those tools on Linux, and you have essentially the same thing, although probably not exactly binary identical.